Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who are watching, uh, this is my first time being live, so I am as nervous as I'll get out. And uh, the audience here in the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Fairfield, Illinois, is laughing at me because they've never seen me nervous before. <laughs> Okay, today starts an adventure. Uh, the Lord's really been doing something in my life in this last year. Um, and while you've been around and I've been leaking, I want to start sharing it on an intentional basis. So while I was in New Zealand for two months and not preaching, I spent a long time thinking about how I could share what I was learning in a way that was meaningful. And this is not something that I'm just sharing it because it's a curiosity. It's because it's something that has really changed my perspective on my life and my relationship with Jesus and how I live my life. So, I want to start with a question. Are you a follower of Jesus? We're afraid to answer. <laughs> okay, uh, this, is a, this is a loaded question, okay? For some of my friends, they would say absolutely not, okay? and that's okay. They are my friends. I have others who automatically say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Let me rephrase the question. What does it mean to share someone else's story? And you're story, like, same as testimony or different than testimony? Okay, now I'm really off the wall and you're saying, what in the world is Steve talking about? Let me start with a story. I was a boy, no more than eight or nine. My dad was talking to a friend. At the time, we lived out on the edge of the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico on a mission station. And they were talking about their dream of recruiting a doctor to staff a full-time clinic to serve the people around them. We were 50 miles from the closest blacktop road, and there were no medical services. But the challenges they were facing just seemed insurmountable. What doctor would be interested in practicing 50 miles from the closest blacktop road? And my dad looked pointedly at me and he said, well, I guess if we can't recruit one, I'll just have to grow one. <laughs> Love it. That joke became a part of my story. That joke was a part of his story. And we have told it individually and collectively numerous times. You ask me how I became a doctor, the joke gets told. You ask him what his son does, the joke gets told. He and I share a story and we live in each other's story. It communicates how my identity grew out of my father and it communicates his legacy in me. Now today I wanna to introduce you to a Bible passage that in the last year has become a part of my story. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Bobby, would you read that for us? Sure. Matthew 10, 29 and 30, correct? Correct. Okay. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. When you step through the doors of this church, you are faced with a guest registry in the foyer. If you don't sign it, I do. For us. For you. <laughs> yeah. 
because I have this mantra, we have this mantra, everybody counts, so we count everybody. It's just one of the ways that we try to make our, help ourselves experience what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. It's a little hokey, I admit, okay? But our counting people in church is nothing compared to the counting that God does. He doesn't count if you're in church. He counts how many hairs are on your head while you're in church or while you're not in church. Now, bear with me. There are approximately 120 square inches of your scalp on your head. Trust Google, okay? 120 square inches of scalp with an average of 833 hair follicles per square inch. That amounts to 100,000 hairs that God is counting on each one of our heads. I wonder what the refresh rate is on that data. <laughs> you know, like a stock ticker. Okay, how often does God ask his angels to recount the hairs on your head? Once a day? Once an hour? A minute? A second? Is this live? Okay, what's the refresh rate? Okay, um, you know, it's... Um, this is a data manager's nightmare, okay? Think of all the data points pouring in. Who's watching them? What are we doing with this data? What does it mean? More importantly, why are we, why are we measuring all this data, okay? If you've ever been a quality manager, you get asked that question all the time. I can hear the angels up in, up in heaven. God, why are we counting hairs today? Oh no, I'm on hair duty today. <laughs> Where are God's priorities? Why is he wasting angels' time counting hair? What about some of the kids there? The day before they had thousands of hairs, hundreds of thousands of hairs, and the next day they have none. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The angels are crazy. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and the angel assigned to their head, their head after cancer therapy is saying, Phew, now I get a rest. <laughs> it's not just hair that God worries about, okay? He worries about other trivia, like sparrows. You know, imagine what it would have been like if he was counting, having angels count sparrow feathers, okay? But God cares about sparrows. I wonder if the same is true of mosquitoes and flies. <laughs> let's not discriminate here. Yes, let's. Okay. You better have a really good point for this. Yes, <laughs> you <both laughs> us. Okay, now, just imagine with me. Don't bring up spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about spiders, but no. I, I, I got <coughs> feedback from my friends online that said spiders are taboo in church. That's right. right. Okay. Imagine with me the activity of the angels. Okay? There's this desk up in heaven where the data entry occurs. Angel flies in, zip! Sparrow number 932,844,566,298. Fallen. Check! Zip, zip! Hair number 633,000. Oh, no, not 600. <laughs> wow, what a head of hair that would be. Hair number 129, Gerald Horn. It's growing. <laughs> Check. Zip, zip. Hair number uh, 932,549, Amanda. Fallen. Check. Zip, zip. And they're just zip, zip, zipping, zip, zipping, zipping, back and forth all the I wonder if each angel is assigned one hair to monitor or if the hair comes by a head full. What a headache. 
And Vivian is looking at me and she's saying, oh my goodness, what in the world is he talking about? Why did Jesus tell this parable besides asking Steve to make a fool of himself? <laughs> I think there are three reasons. There are three lessons out of this parable that are very, very meaningful to me. One, God wants an intimate relationship. When you were born, your dad counted your fingers and toes. I have seen it happen hundreds of times. How many toes? How many toes? Ten? Oh, 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 good, 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 good. How many fingers? How many fingers? Ten? Oh, good, he's all there! As if that's the only parts that matter. Okay? But take fingers and toes. That's what dads care about when a baby's born. God started Godding, counting body parts and much, much more before you, your dad even had a twinkle in his eyes. Sometimes it appears that Christians think God only cares about one thing. Marge Allen, saved, not saved. Saved, great, next person. Bobby Gage, saved, not saved. Oh, saved, yeah, good, good, let's go on. Next person. I mean, it's like God only cares about whether we're saved or lost. The gospel that Jesus taught was radically different. God is so intimately connected with your life. He cares so much about you that he counts the hairs on your head. And this connection is independent of anything that you or I do. Jesus didn't say, if you follow me and you're part of the kingdom, God counts the hairs on your head. He said, God is counting the hairs on your head, period. Independent of what you do, because that's what he does. Independent of who you are, because that's who he is. And Jesus didn't just talk about this intimacy, he lived it. John and Andrew were the first people who got interested in Jesus. And they came to him and they said, Master, where do you live? So he pulled out a business card and handed it to him. <laughs> oh, no, no, let the, okay, no. He pulled out his phone and he Bluetoothed his contact information over. No. He said, Come and see. Come and see. He invited them in. When he was calling the other disciples, he didn't say, uh, Peter, Peter, you know, I really, really think you have a lot of potential. I want you to join my global school of evangelism, and I want you to become a worldwide evangelist. That isn't what he said. He said, Follow me. Follow me. Jesus did not network, network with people or recruit them so much as he stepped into their lives, into their stories, and invited them to come into his. His invitation to us today is exactly the same. He doesn't ask you to get saved. He asks you to follow him. And following him means stepping into his story and letting him step into yours. Now, when you follow someone, when you follow someone through the woods, what do you do, Brian? You follow them. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You walk where they walk. You walk yeah, okay? Where you, right. you, you keep your eyes on them. You know where they're going. You're not... If you're following someone through the woods, you're not lollygagging over here watching the deer, you know. <laughs> Somebody doesn't know how to follow, does he? <laughs> That's good. Okay. But Jesus was saying, join me in my story. Let our stories mingle and merge until the two 
become one. When Vivian and I got married, I have to confess, I knew very little bit about what it meant to be married. I had this idea that it meant you slept in the same bed, you lived in the same house, you ate the same food, you took care of the same pets, you raised the same children, but really, I was clueless about what it meant to be married. And 40 years later, sometimes I still think I'm clueless. Because we'll be, we'll be going along, living our lives, apparently in sync, everything's rosy, no fights, no, no uh, you know. And all of a sudden, it's like a window opens, and I see down into her soul, and all of a sudden I realize that I've been ignorant of her deepest fears, her greatest desires, her true beauty, and I'm just, I just gasp at the intimacy that comes into our relationship. How can you live for 40 years with someone and be ignorant about what's going on inside of her? That's what God is offering us today. That's the level of intimacy that he wants with you and I. Intimacy. No walls. No distance. No, no defenses. That can be terrifying. Because intimacy... Intimacy is abused more than it's honored. It's used more than it's protected. Intimacy is ground zero for domestic violence, sexual abuse, emotional trauma, all of the other dark secrets that we hide inside of our family circles and inside of our closest relationships have their, their ground zero in intimacy. Governments abuse intimacy all the time. They use it as a tool of control and manipulation. The arguments that we hear about data privacy and gun control all have their roots in our fear of intimacy. We don't want just any corporation or government to, to know all the details of our lives. We're afraid they will abuse it. Conversely, those who, be, who, who fight against gun control, they don't want to give up their ability to defend themselves against the government because they don't trust the government. Relationships today have become disposable just like plastic bags and paper plates because we don't trust intimacy. And so God doesn't offer us just intimacy. In this little parable is hidden a second thing that God offers us. Security. Security. He says we'll never be left alone never abandoned. Never. Our circumstances will be challenging. Our path will lead through fire and flood. But he will always be there. He won't disappear on us. The world we live in will be heartless and cruel. Our pain is meaningless. It's just an echo of the anger and despair that we're surrounded with in the lives of other people. Oh, we put on happy masks, especially when we come to church, but we all know it's there. Life is a struggle. But God says, I will always hear your cry. I will always feel your pain. My heart will always be connected to yours. And I will always be there doing everything I can to give you strength and encouragement and hope. And more than being there, okay, 
I mean, someone saying that they're going to be there is kind of meaningless if you know that they're just going to be there to control you. Okay? I've seen men and women who wouldn't let their spouse or their children out of their sight. They wanted to be there for them. What they really meant was, I don't trust you any further and I can throw you, and so you're going to stay right here because I'm going to control everything you do and think and say. That's not God. At the same time, he promises he will always be here. He promises he'll never abuse us. Jesus' enemies preached to God with two faces. One minute, he was slapping you upside the head with a two-by-four, and the next, he was so solicitous. Oh, honey, are you hurt? Let's, let, let's get a, a Band-Aid on that boo-boo. Fists of steel hidden inside a glove, a glove of velvet. And because they believed in that kind of God, they would tiptoe past a wounded man on the sidewalk to make sure they, their church clothes didn't get dirty. They would do whatever it took to prove that they were right, even if it meant crucifying an innocent man. Their God was not Jesus' God. The God that Jesus talked about was radically different than that. His God was a ray of light in darkness. His God was a firm foundation in a storm. His God was a selfless shepherd who'd go out in the night and search all night to find one silly, stupid lamb. His God was a father who would stand at the door and watch day after day after day, hoping that his runaway son would come home. When people stumbled into Jesus' presence, children laughed. The sick were healed. The weak became strong. The powerless discovered they could fly, figuratively, okay? And those who were enslaved in habits and behaviors that they knew were destroying them suddenly found out that they were free. As the song says, you, you are my wholeness. You are my completeness, my soul, my thirsty soul can rest in the depths of your love. Jesus wants to step into each of our stories today wholly, completely, intimately. And in so doing, he offers to bring all of the wholeness all of the completeness, all of the healing and sealing and revealing that is a part of his story into our story. Intimate security. This is the ultimate fairy tale. Cinderella becomes a queen overnight. Snow White wakes up with a kiss. Little Lord Fauntleroy yeah, little Lord Fauntleroy, one of my favorite heroes on steroids. That's who the God of Jesus is. He offers us something I can't even imagine. I have friends, I have friendships, but they don't hold a candle to this. I can only imagine what this kind of friendship is like. There's another song. When all of my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, oh, to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. 
Now, that song has been kind of spoiled for my generation because we took offense at the word glory. We were, we were the first PC crowd. And glory, you, glory, that's selfish. You know, you Christians are selfish. You're talking about glory for you. Well, that's because we twisted the language. The word glory has another meaning, which means heavenly bliss. Bliss. That's the kind of glory that God wants to bring into our lives with the intimacy and security that he has. Not pie in the sky, by and by kind of bliss. No, the fruit of the spirit in our lives kind of bliss. Joy, peace, love. Intimacy unfathomable, security unimaginable. Bliss unadulterated. That's the parable of the sparrow and the hares. So let me ask you a question again. Are you a follower of Jesus? Do you share his story or do you have your story down here and he's up there and he's got his story and yeah, I know I'm supposed to find, somehow find a connection between them and I'm supposed to have this relationship with him but really, you know, it's just me down here. It's just me down here. I have to do it myself. What I'm suggesting to you today is that if that is your experience, God wants to offer you something much more. If your experience with Christianity has been, are you saved or not? Throw that out the door. The question is not whether you're saved or not. The question is, do you have a relationship with Jesus and are you sharing his story? So, I want to say yes to Jesus. That's what's changed in my life in the last year is I've realized that I don't have to do this on my own. I don't have to live alone. I can share his story. All I have to do is follow him. Now, this is just the beginning. I just wanted to, to try to communicate the degree of intimacy that God wants to have in each of, your, each of our lives. And this concept of sharing God's story is what has changed my life in the last year. So as we go on from here, that's what we're going to be exploring. What does it mean to share God's story? How is this different from what we have experienced in our lives so far? And what difference does it make? So I want to thank you. Signing off now. Have a good day.